History is often relegated to a list of names and places and dates. However, the reality is that history is about real people with many of the same struggles faced today. The stories of the past connect us with those who came before. Bartholomew County historian Susanna Jones knew that and wanted to convey to everyone that history can be fun and engaging. In 1985, she wrote an excellent book that covered the first 60 years since our county's founding. Obviously, then as now, there is so much history to document, it would be impossible to capture everything. Still, every story has a beginning, and as Susanna's title states, in our case, it began with Bartholomew. General Joseph Bartholomew was born in 1766. In 1798, Bartholomew brought his family to the newly created Indiana Territory. He gained fame as a military officer, and this is where he met General John Tipton. Both fought at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811 against a powerful Native American alliance formed by the Shawnee leader Tecumseh. However, it was his brother Tenskwatawa that led the forces into battle against his brother's wishes. The Native forces suffered a devastating loss that would have repercussions for decades. Bartholomew and Tipton served in the Indiana State Legislature together and were two of the ten commissioners chosen to select the site of the new state capital, which would become the city of Indianapolis. Though they were of different political parties, Tipton introduced the 1821 legislation to name the newly formed Bartholomew County after his commander and friend. The generals were no different from any other white inhabitants at that time and believed they were more civilized than the Native Americans. Tipton and Bartholomew spent their military careers fighting indigenous peoples and negotiating often lopsided treaties that allowed white settlers to claim these lands. While some of these actions by our ancestors are cruel by today's standards, we must put them into the context of their times. Should men like Bartholomew and Tipton be held up as heroes? Should they be viewed as villains on the wrong side of history? Or perhaps both? Current and future generations will decide those important questions. Although Bartholomew County was founded in 1821, the area was inhabited much earlier. The first people to live on this land are known as pre-contact Native Americans who lived in America before the Europeans arrived. These Native people moved seasonally and lived along waterways used for agriculture and transportation. Archaeological evidence supports the presence of Native people in the area at least 3,000 years ago. In the late 18th and early 19th century, the tribes of the Miami, Delaware, and Potawatomi lived in Indiana. The Delaware tribe in particular lived along the banks of the Flat Rock River and Clifty Creek, both of which run through Bartholomew County. In 1794, the Battle of Fallen Timbers near Toledo, Ohio, led to the Miami tribe abandoning their lands in Ohio to the U.S. government and moving west into what would become central and eastern Indiana. Over the next 25 years, a variety of skirmishes, raids, and treaties resulted in the native people losing almost all of their land in this area. The Battle of Tippecanoe occurred in Indiana in 1811 when future U.S. President William Henry Harrison and his troops defeated the Confederation of Native Americans, forcing the Native Americans to cede more land. Two of Harrison's fellow Indian fighters at the Battle of Tippecanoe were Joseph Bartholomew and John Tipton both of whom would later be involved in early Indiana politics and were instrumental in the founding of Bartholomew County. Tipton and Bartholomew would be part of skirmishes with the natives throughout the region. One such incident occurred in 1813 when Tipton led an attack on the Delaware near the East Fork of the White River just south of Bartholomew County. Although this was not a large conflict, a monument to what became known as the Battle of Tipton's Island stands in Jackson County on private property near the banks of the river. The two men were working on orders from the government to rid the area of Indians and soon came north through the future Bartholomew County on an Indian raid. John Tipton traveled through the area several more times in the following years and while camping along the Driftwood River, he wrote in his journal, this is good land, good water, and good timber. The good water Tipton was probably referring to was the area at the confluence of the Driftwood and Flat Rock Rivers. Within Bartholomew County, the Driftwood River flows south from the northwest, and the Flat Rock River flows from the northeast. 
The two rivers meet near the middle of the county, forming the East Fork of the White River. South of Columbus, Hawk Creek joins the East Fork of the White River, and farther south, Clifty Creek and Big Sand Creek connect with the waterway as well. Today, the confluence can be seen near downtown Columbus at Millrace Park. John Tipton's personal journal entry recognized that the waterways, forest, and rich land that had attracted native people to the area would be attracted to white settlers as well. Indiana became the 19th state admitted to the Union on December 11, 1816. This map from 1817 to 1818 shows the settled areas in southern Indiana with vast areas of northern Indiana still occupied by native tribes and only 20 of the eventual 92 counties organized. With the Treaty of St. Mary's in 1818, the U.S. government forced the Miami and other tribes to vacate a large section of land in central Indiana and opened up much of the state to settlement. The land ceded in the treaty became known as the New Purchase. This new territory meant the U.S. government could start selling the property to new settlers. The land that would become Bartholomew County was surveyed in 1819 and put up for sale at land offices in Jeffersonville and Brookville at an initial cost of $1.25 per acre. The land sales were brisk, and by 1820, at least 198 men had purchased land. In 1821, another 111 men and at least one woman became Bartholomew County landowners. These early land purchases were for areas all over the county except the far western edge. The parcels of land around the Driftwood and Flat Rock Rivers were generally most popular due to their suitability for farming. Not until after 1830 were the western and southwestern areas of the county settled. In 1819, John Tipton was among a small group of men who purchased county land before official sales began. As a member of the Indiana State Legislature, Tipton introduced the legislation for this area to become a county and be named for his friend, fellow soldier and legislator, General Joseph Bartholomew. The act was passed, and on January 9, 1821, Bartholomew County became the 36th county in Indiana. Tipton later sold some of the land he had purchased to be used for the county seat, and the county commissioners named it Tiptona in his honor. However, just a few weeks later, the name was changed to Columbus. There is speculation, but no evidence as to why the name was changed, and there are no original maps that show the county seat with its temporary name. John Tipton did not stay in Columbus, but instead moved north of Indianapolis, where another Indiana county and its county seat bear his name. He also later served in the U.S. Senate. Joseph Bartholomew moved his family from southern Indiana to Illinois. With the threat of interactions with the native population nearly gone, the first permanent settlers started to arrive in 1819. Joseph and Mary Cox and their family, including several adult children with families of their own, moved into the area called the Hall Patch, which was the land between the Flat Rock River and Hall Creek. The Hall Patch and Hall Creek were named for the numerous Hall trees growing there. Joseph Cox built his first cabin near Hall Creek, where today the intersection of Rocky Ford and Marr Road is located. In 1820, the Joseph Cox family purchased 1,300 acres of land for $1,625. Several of Joseph Cox's original land grant certificates exist, including this one dated 1821, which reflects the purchase of 80 acres near the original Cox cabin. As was typical of all land grant documents in the United States before 1830, it was signed by the U.S. President, James Monroe. Cox and his family cleared the first county road and built a grist or flour mill near the rocky ford across Hall Creek. This mill lasted only two years before Joseph Cox moved it to the Flat Rock River due to low water supply of the creek. A ford was a shallow place where rivers or streams could be crossed on foot, on horseback, or by vehicle. Because of the cost and difficulty of constructing bridges, Fords were commonplace all over the United States, and Bartholomew County had several of these in the 19th century. One of Bartholomew County's most well-known Fords was located on Clifty Creek east of Columbus. It was often called Fatal Ford because it was considered dangerous to cross here even when the water level was low. Hawk Creek could also be forded or crossed at this shallow spot near the first Cox cabin. For that reason, the road here was eventually named Rocky Ford Road. Prior to construction of a bridge in 1968, travelers on Rocky Ford Road had to drive into and across the creek bed to cross Hall Creek. 
Some residents would even bring their cars here to wash them in the mid-20th century, which could cause significant trouble for other traffic in the area. The graves of Joseph and Mary Cox lie along the west side of Middle Road, just north of Rocky Ford Road. All of the property from the area where the Cox cabin was located to the gravesite, a distance of about one mile, was owned by the Cox family. There were originally four markers with a headstone and a footstone for each grave, but today only three remain. Near the grave sites is one of the oldest homes in the area. Joshua Sims was another early settler who arrived in the future Bartholomew County in 1820, just a year after Joseph Cox. In 1836, Sims purchased a parcel of land from the Cox family and built a home. Over more than 180 years, the property passed through a variety of owners. The home was enlarged and remodeled, but still stands proudly in its original location on Rocky Ford Road. While the native peoples traveled mostly by foot, Settlers arrived on horseback and by wagon as primitive roads were cut through the forests. Because the soil was soft and full of clay and roads were littered with tree stumps, most wagon roads were passable only a few months of each year. In 1820, the Indiana State Legislature provided for several so-called permanent roads to aid in the settlement and the development of the state. These routes would later become known as state roads. The roads were surveyed immediately, but it took several years before any were completed. The first state road to pass through Bartholomew County was the Mox Ferry Road, which ran from the Ohio River through Corridon and Brownstown, and then followed the Driftwood River part of the way to Indianapolis. The Mox Ferry Road was surveyed by John Tipton and completed in 1824. It followed an old Indian trail two miles west of Columbus and did not run through the town. It was speculation that Tipton intentionally bypassed the county seat because of his displeasure that the name had changed from Tiptona to Columbus. A second state road called the Madison Road was completed in 1825 and traveled from Madison to Indianapolis through Bartholomew County. The Madison Road between Madison and Columbus later became State Road 7. Bartholomew County benefited from having three major rivers and three major creeks to provide cheap water power and the water routes for transportation. In pioneer times, local farmers and merchants would bring their extra crops or merchandise to the banks of the river in wagons and load them onto flatboats. Within the county, the Driftwood River was known for its shallow depths and for the dangerous floating logs and debris that gave the river its name. For those reasons, flatboats traveled carefully and tied up at night to avoid disaster. After the East Fork of the White River passed through neighboring Jackson County, the depth increased and boats could float safely day and night. Most of these boats were carrying goods to the Wabash River, the Ohio River, and eventually to the Mississippi River. Boatmen would sometimes take their goods all the way to New Orleans to sell them for cash. Then the boats would be sold for lumber and the boatmen would walk back to Columbus. This round trip took about two to three months. The first meeting of the Bartholomew County Commissioners occurred on February 15, 1821 at the cabin of Luke Bonesteel on the banks of the East Fork of the White River at what would eventually be the west end of First Street. The location of the county seat was chosen to be at the confluence of the rivers, which was also the center of the new county. The town was surveyed into lots with four main streets. The lots were 75 feet by 150 feet. The first public sale of land within Columbus occurred in June of 1821. The lots did not have a fixed price but were sold at auction for an average of $51.55, which was more than the cost of 40 acres of land in the rest of the county. The most expensive lot within town sold for $211 from the north corner of what today is 2nd and Jackson Streets across from the courthouse square. The cheapest lots were at the southwest edge of town near the river and sold for just $11 each. This original plat map from Columbus shows how small the original town boundaries were. The river formed the west edge of town, and the further streets to the east was Mechanic Street, known today as Lafayette. The east-west streets all had names such as Walnut Street or Tipton Street. Not until the 1870s would these become numbered streets. The open square visible in the center of the map was reserved for the county courthouse. Luke Bonesteel provided his cabin on the banks of the river to be used as the first courthouse. Not until 1829 was the courthouse erected on Courthouse Square, 
which was on land originally owned by Tipton. It was a relatively small brick structure that was used until 1839. The Third County Courthouse, the second on the courthouse square, was another two-story brick building with a cupola and a bell. It served the purposes of the county government from 1839 to 1874. By 1870, the county began planning for a larger, more permanent courthouse structure. Designed by Isaac Hodgson, construction of the second Empire-style building took place from 1871 to 1874. The foundation stone, finishing stones, and bricks were sourced from central Indiana. Final cost was around $250,000, including $5,000 to purchase the tower clock and bell from the Howard Clock Company in Boston. Here, the courthouse is closer to completion, but still missing its windows and the distinctive tower clock. The building to the left behind the courthouse to the south is the county jail, which was built around the same time in the same style. In December 1874, the fourth county courthouse opened with great fanfare and a celebration marked by music, speeches, and dancing, and covered by newspapers outside of the state. The courthouse clock was installed a few months later in 1875, and the 154-foot clock tower. The original 6-inch thick 10-ton bell still sits in the tower and rings every hour. The clock continued to run with its original weighted mechanisms until 1940 when a cable snap and the smaller of the two weights, which weighed about 500 pounds, crashed through its wooden supports within the tower. This was considered somewhat lucky because officials believe that if the larger 1,200-pound weight had fallen, it likely would have crashed all the way through to the basement. The original clock mechanism still powers the clock today, but it has been electrified since 1940. The exterior of the building is largely unchanged, except a remodeling in 1953 removed all chimneys and all but one dormer and replaced the original slate roof with a seamed copper one. Interior renovations over the years have modernized the same building, including adding an elevator for easier access to all four floors. At the same time, much of the original interior of the courthouse has been preserved, including the curving staircase, Superior Court 1, many of the heavy interior doors, and the decorative ceiling ornamentation on the first floor. The courthouse archives room on the first floor includes one of the building's original fireplaces and the bell from the previous courthouse. For almost a century, the courthouse square remained largely unchanged as well, with the 1870s jail standing just south of the courthouse. However, in 1962, this jail was demolished and a new law enforcement building was built on the southwest corner of the square. The new building housed the jail and the police and sheriff's departments. Today's Bartholomew County Jail was constructed in 1990 about a block away from the courthouse on property east of City Hall on 2nd Street and replaced the functions of the law enforcement building. Today, 25 limestone pillars stand on the lawn behind the courthouse as part of the Bartholomew County Memorial to Veterans, which was installed in 1997. Letters from the Bartholomew County soldiers sent back home in the midst of war are inscribed on the pillars and capture poignant moments in time about difficult moments in our history. After over 140 years, county government businesses continue to be conducted inside the Bartholomew County Courthouse, which remains one of the most recognizable buildings in the area. It has been on the National Register of Historic Places since 1979. In addition to the small size of the town and the open courthouse square, another remarkable aspect of the earliest map of Columbus is the absence of bridges to cross the river at that time. For many years, the only way to cross was by boat. John Lindsay, a nephew of John Tipton, was granted a license to operate the first ferry just downstream from the confluence of the Driftwood and Flat Rock Rivers. Lindsay paid $5 to operate his ferry and could charge six and a quarter cents for man, woman, child, or horse. A four-wheel wagon was 50 cents. It wasn't until 1847 that the first wooden bridge was built to cross the river. Travelers had to pay to cross the bridge until 1859. In 1884, this iron wagon bridge over East Fork of White River replaced the old wooden structure. It was known as the Wagon Bridge or the Second Street Bridge. The iron bridge was raised in 1950 for the construction of yet another new bridge which crossed the river at the same location as the previous bridge but originated from Third Street 
and so was called the Third Street Bridge. The 1950 bridge still stands. It originally carried traffic both in and out of town, but today traffic moves one way and the bridge exclusively carries traffic moving west out of town. Traffic into town crosses another bridge, which was built in 1999. The Second Street Bridge is also known as the Robert N. Stewart Bridge, named after the three-term Columbus mayor who served from 1984 to 1996. Today, when travelers enter Columbus from the west side, the Bartholomew County Courthouse is framed within the structure of the suspension bridge. When John Titpen wrote about the good land, good water, and good timber of the area over 200 years ago, it would have been difficult for him to imagine that the county would one day have around 80,000 inhabitants within its borders. The early contributions of settlers such as Joseph and Mary Cox, Luke Bonesteel, John Lindsay, and so many others laid the foundation that has enabled Bartholomew County to grow into one of the most successful counties in Indiana. For over a century, the Bartholomew County Public Library and the Bartholomew County Historical Society have worked to discover, collect, preserve, and share the stories of the people who made Bartholomew County what it is today. We are indebted to the previous work of individuals who believed, as we do, that the knowledge of our collective history is critical to understanding our present and as a valuable tool for informing the future. People like George Pence, Vida Newsom, Ross Crump, Susanna Jones, Harry McCauley, and Tammy Stone Iorio all made it their life's work to think about the generations who came after and to make sure our history was not lost. No matter if your family has been here since the county's founding in 1821, or if you recently located here, Bartholomew County's story is your story. Be inspired by those that came before you and determine from their struggles and their triumphs, what can be your story and how can you make an impact? History is happening every day. Don't let it pass you by. We're very grateful and excited to be a part of this lifelong journey with you.